Essa é mais uma entrevista que eu consegui gravar aqui na LabitConf 2018, no Chile, em Santiago. E essa entrevista é realmente sensacional e histórica para o canal, porque é com ninguém menos que o Dr. Adam Beck. Quem já está nesse meio de Bitcoin, blockchain, criptografia, sabe que o Adam Beck dispensa apresentações. Mas para quem não conhece ele, vale a pena falar um pouco mais. O Adam Beck é um criptógrafo inglês nascido em Londres em 1970. Ele conseguiu o PHD dele em criptografia, em sistemas distribuídos, inclusive, em 96. E ele é uma das figuras mais importantes na história do próprio Bitcoin. E eu já vou falar um pouco mais porquê disso, para quem não sabe. Mas ele é interessante também que ele sempre foi muito ativo na lista de criptografia, aliás, antes ainda, na lista dos cypherpunks, que depois teve suas derivadas, uma delas a lista de criptografia. Mas lá em meados da década de 90, no auge dos cypherpunks, ele era muito ativo, produzia vários e-mails por mês, em 96, 97. E naquela época, assim, de, de, todo o seu histórico, as suas, os seus interesses e paixões, sempre foi privacidade, liberdade de expressão, é, libertarianismo, ele acabou trabalhando também com o próprio David Chalmers no Didcast, ele desenvolveu algumas das, das funcionalidades do Didcast, então ele também teve experiência com o dinheiro eletrônico, ele também se, se acabava se interessando muito por essa parte. E o Adam Beck tem um fato curioso também, que ele, pela questão de privacidade, criptografia, liberdade de expressão, ele acabou se envolvendo em toda a controvérsia no final da década de 90 nos Estados Unidos com aquelas restrições e proibições de exportar criptografia para fora das fronteiras nos Estados Unidos, tanto que a criptografia fazia parte da lista de munições dos Estados Unidos, que é uma lista que proibia diversos produtos e artefatos que não poderiam ser é, enviados para fora da fronteira, porque eram ou armas de defesa ou, ou produtos proibidos. E criptografia era uma delas. E aí o Adam Beck teve uma sacada em, em, pô, em, curiosa, interessante, onde ele imprimiu numa camiseta um algoritmo criptográfico e que quem investisse essa camiseta e, e, e saísse das fronteiras americanas, ultrapassasse a fronteira, estaria infringindo justamente essa lei. Então essa foi uma maneira dele jocosa de desobediência civil para lutar contra essas leis de restrição de exportação de criptografia, que depois acabaram sendo muito flexibilizadas. Mas esse é um fato curioso na história do Adam Beck. Mas o que é interessante para a história do Bitcoin é que vem o seu envolvimento e a, e a sua relevância na, no, na própria criação do Bitcoin pelo Satoshi Nakamoto, é que em 1997 o Adam Beck criou o chamado Hashcash. Ele enviou então um e-mail lá na lista de discussão do Cypherpunks, falando do Hashcash, que era uma ideia de se criar selos postais para correio eletrônico, como a medida anti-spam, para prevenir spam. Eu já falei sobre isso aqui, acho que numa palestra, as origens do Bitcoin, onde eu falo sobre isso. Mas essa era a ideia do Hashcash. E por que é importante o Hashcash? É porque esse, essa inovação, na verdade, foi a inspiração, serviu como inspiração para o Satoshi Nakamoto criar a função algorítmica do, da prova de trabalho. Então o Hashcash é a inspiração para a prova, do trabalho, de prova de trabalho, o Proof of Work do Bitcoin, que é o coração da mineração. Então essa, essa é a importância. E tanto é que o Hashcash, ou melhor, o Adam Beck, é uma das pouquíssimas pessoas citadas no paper do Satoshi Nakamoto. Lá quando foi divulgado, no dia 31 de outubro de 2008, uma das poucas referências que tem lá é o Hashcash do Adam Beck. E o, o, o Adam Beck, ele conta num, numa, acho que foi numa postagem que ele fez, na, ou em alguma entrevista que ele falou sobre isso, que o Satoshi Nakamoto, inclusive, contatou o Adam Beck antes de ser publicado o White Paper, lá em meados de 2008. E foi o Adam Beck que direcionou o Satoshi Nakamoto e disse, olha, pela sua ideia que você está relatando, dá uma olhada no B-Money, que era uma ideia do Wei Dai, outro cypherpunk, e num dos e-mails que o Satoshi Nakamoto enviou dessa vez para o Eidai, o Eidai também publica isso, ele divulgou esses e-mails, é, o Satoshi Nakamoto diz, ó, oh, cheguei aqui por conta do, do Adam Beck, me disse da sua, intenção, da sua ideia do B-Money, e eu queria apenas confirmar qual é a data de, de publicação do B-Money para poder referenciar de forma correta lá no White Paper. E aí vocês podem ver, está lá no White Paper, tanto o B-Money do Eidai e o Hashcash do Adam Beck. E o que é interessante nessa história também é que o Adam Beck, quando ele recebeu a mensagem do Nakamoto e depois quando ele viu finalmente o white paper e o software em funcionamento, ele não se entusiasmou, ele era cético, ele não acreditava que o Bitcoin pudesse realmente decolar 
e ele fala isso, eu também faço essa pergunta depois nessa entrevista, vocês vão ver. Então ele, ele demorou muito tempo até para realmente começar a se envolver com o Bitcoin. E isso apenas aconteceu lá em meados de 2013, como o próprio Adam Beck, numa postagem no bitcointalk.org, eu vou botar o link aqui embaixo, onde ele se apresenta até como um novato no, nesse mundo de, do Bitcoin, e ele fala qual é o seu histórico, o que ele fez, e que ele estava realmente começando a, a, a explorar e tentar entender um pouco mais sobre o Bitcoin. E hoje, ele, então, ele não apenas é uma figura importantíssima em termos de história, e de, de inspiração para a própria criação do Bitcoin, como ele também está envolvido diretamente no desenvolvimento de novas soluções, porque ele também é fundador e CEO da Blockstream, que quem já está nesse mundo sabe que é uma empresa hoje importante, que desenvolve soluções uh, para Lightning Network, soluções para side, de sidechains, e, enfim, várias soluções uh, interessantes dentro desse mundo de, de Bitcoin e blockchain. Então, essa entrevista que vocês já vão assistir é realmente é, é histórica para o canal, porque o nome desse, com esse peso, com essa importância, é, é simplesmente fantástico. Eu me senti muito honrado de poder sentar aqui na LabitConf, poder conversar com ele. É, é realmente é demais. Eu tenho certeza que se em 20 ou 30 anos nós tivermos o Hall da Fama do Bitcoin, eu não tenho a menor dúvida que o Dr. Adam Beck será um dos nomes indicados a ter o seu, a sua figura, lá, o seu nome eternizado na história do Bitcoin. Então, confiram essa, essa entrevista realmente histórica para o canal e acho que vocês, tenho certeza que vocês vão gostar bastante. Maybe some of the, the questions that I'd like to ask is about the beginning with Bitcoin. So, for example, what was your first reaction when Nakamoto sent you an email regarding Bitcoin, even before he published a white paper? Um, so, I mean, it didn't occur to me that he would be uh, that it would be an anonymous or pseudon pseudonym mm -hmm. because. Um, if you have some papers or source code for different systems online, once in a while people will email you to comment on them or send you their paper, which is related in some way. So I thought, okay, it's another kind of email about this kind of topic. And um, so, and I suggested that he could look at uh, Wei Dai's B Money, which is a quite related idea. And uh, it seems that he contacted Wei Day afterwards and asked him about uh, B Money and put a citation for B Money into the paper. And I mean, in terms of um, the properties of the system, you know, so how Finney uh, installed it and did a lot of experiments, and I think um, is known to have done the first transaction in Bitcoin. Um, and he, he sort of you know, explained what he did. He wrote up a summary of how it worked. And so more people uh, participated in that discussion, which was in January, I think. And you know, for context, like the previous electronic cash systems were very strong privacy and fungibility using cryptography. But they had the characteristic that it was um, a centralized system yeah. so it, it was a completely different trade-off so you know the uh, the privacy was strong of the open transactions the, the public <coughs> transactions yes yeah, so I mean so my first thought was well okay it's it's good that it's decentralized because we saw the previous centralized system digicash system uh, shut down not because it, of uh, you know outside pressure, but because they failed, like they ran out of money on a, on a business level, and um, so you know this system is decentralized, so it won't have that problem. But it's difficult to have this kind of cryptographic privacy in a decentralized system. You need a different uh, different cryptographic constructs, and it's much harder because there's no sort of signing key, because there are only anonymous participants like miners and they're not necessarily persistent they can change at will so it's actually much more difficult to do and so you know the 
The lack of privacy was one thing that struck me, and the other thing is the security model is different. So in the uh, centralized systems, you have normal digital signature levels of security, which is if you assume that the server's private key is not compromised, which is a big assumption, grant you, but this is the way people thought about these things, that basically it's sort of practically impossible for somebody to forge a signature, you know, it would take hundreds of years with a supercomputer or something. And with Bitcoin, that's not, not the case. It's, it's, uh, so in, in public key cryptography, on even symmetric key cryptography, if you don't have the key, you have an enormous disadvantage, you know, astronomical disadvantage in work to break it. Whereas with Bitcoin, the balance between somebody who might want to attack the system and somebody who wants to use it and benefit from it and contribute is 50-50. Is I mean, it's whoever puts more effort in. And so from a normal kind of security model point of view, that's quite novel and it feels like uh, weaker, you know. But for all of that, you know, basically, if you look at the existing non-cryptographic money systems, they're also very weak. You know, people can forge uh, banknotes very cheaply and easily, and it's pretty rampant, and governments can you know, inflate it. And so, um, basically, if you come down to it, money works because people need and want it to work, and they live with its limitations. And so Bitcoin, you know, solves real problems because it's decentralized. It had kind of weak privacy, um, and, you know, so another, another, there is a paper that somebody had published in, I think it was like 93 or something, called Auditable Electronic Cash by Sander and Tashma, and that uh, cash system had no private key. So it, it would be possible to use it in a Bitcoin-like system. So that was my other thought. I was like, well, why didn't he use that paper? So, you know, one reason would be well, I maybe didn't know about it because it's uh, more esoteric. I think mean, Bitcoin uses um, robust and simple established cryptography, which is which is the right thing to do if you're trying to design a secure system. But there's another problem with that paper, which is it's uh, it's expensive. Like the, the the transactions become tens of kilobytes, and actually, uh, ZeroCoin, which is a much more recent paper, mm -hmm. is an optimization of that paper. They they cite that paper, so they had the same idea that oh, they could use that kind of technique for Bitcoin, so it's using like zero knowledge, set membership yes. proofs and things. And if I understand correctly, initially when the software was released, the white paper and the software was released in 2009, you were not very enthusiastic about it, you were perhaps kind of skeptical. What, if I understand correctly, please do correct me, but what made you change your mind and that Bitcoin could really function and scale? Well, I mean, I thought it was so I wouldn't say I was uh, skeptical that it could work, but it wasn't clear that it would take off, like it would bootstrap and get get a network effect and achieve a price. Because, you know, for some years there was basically no price and the people that were trading things were doing it on a novelty basis, right? The 50,000 Bitcoin pizza and stuff like that. So, but I mean, I had a reason to suppose that it could bootstrap, which is, that myself and a number of people participated in a previous attempt to bootstrap uh, Digicash's uh, demo system. So they had um, a, a demo server that they set up and they promised it would only have uh, one million coins, which they called Cyberbucks. And the, you know, so they said, well, we'll operate this as a service. And if you want some coins, just email us and we'll send you some. And so a few people thought, well, if we sell things, and because they're cyber bucks, people thought, well, let's pretend they're worth a dollar. So they would sell like t-shirts and different things that we could create a value in what was supposed to be a demo system. So the, the, the concept of trying to bootstrap it by, you know, enthusiast community effort was something I saw and even participated in. So, you know, I could see that maybe that could work for Bitcoin. Like what happened the previous time is they, they they went bankrupt right right around the middle of this experiment, so we didn't see the conclusion. So uh, I guess, you know, from my perspective, I was like, well, this is, it's very interesting that somebody has made a deployable system. Previous systems were designs, typically, that weren't implemented, like B-Money and Bitgold. They hadn't been implemented. And I think many people took the lesson from Digicash that 
the reason it shut, you know, because it shut down, the a practical system would have to be decentralized because we'd seen a centralized system fail. So that was that was good. Not so good was the kind of weaker security model, but it, it seemed to be necessary. Like there was no obvious better way to do it. And the question mark, like, will it bootstrap? So it took a few years, but you know, as as people saw, like, wow, Bitcoin got into the news because it was a dollar or something. You know, when when things like that happen, or then a hundred dollars and so on, it, people start to think, well, it's not a question anymore. It has bootstrapped, right? And so, and and then there were started to be exchanges and things, so it became easier to buy Bitcoin for a, a defined price. So fast forward to today. And now we're discussing scalability, security, and, and also privacy. Yeah. And your last panel here at LaBitConf, we were talking about you were talking about privacy. And the question I wanted to make there, and wasn't able to because the panel ended, is as I see it nowadays, it seems to me that privacy is not only a use case. It's for me, it's more related to security of the network, not only as personal security for people using the system. But also in terms of if if transactions can be somehow censored or coins can be tainted and they can not be processed and confirmed with the network, it might even damage fungibility and perhaps even in an extreme case make the whole system collapse. So I see right. privacy related to security of the system as well. We also have this view of privacy. Yeah, I mean I think that's you know with the previous systems they had basically cryptographic fungibility. So the guarantee that, uh, so in the DigiCash case, it's kind of an interesting piece of cryptography. It's actually very simple in the way it works, but it was something that David Chaum had invented, this blind signature thing, which he came up with in 1985, but it took some years to you know, start a company and try to adopt it. But um, you know, if, if uh, I would withdraw a coin from the bank and hand it to you. You'd have to deposit it in the bank straight away to prevent double spending. But even you and the bank colluding couldn't tell the coin came from me versus any other user. So it had, it had guaranteed fungibility because nobody was a, would be able to link the coin. So it's a guarantee. Where with Bitcoin, the fungibility is sort of more best effort, right? So you're assuming that if one miner tries to not process your transaction even though it's you know paying a, a good enough fee to fit in the current set of transactions yes. um, that another miner will do it in the next block and another one and they're anonymous so they don't have you know they're not exposed to outside pressures as much and they're in different countries and they can leave and join and nobody really knows who processed the transaction even so you get kind of practical fungibility but it's different because even though it's fungible, like de facto, like it gets processed, it's traceable and linkable, and then that that creates uh, in practice fungibility problems with Bitcoin already. You know, some uh, exchanges and service providers will reject merchants. You know, they don't like the type of business they're doing, and you're not even talking about illegal things; just things people have you know, gray market things or pornography or marijuana, things which may be legal in specific places, but they choose not to process. And so, you know, I think with Bitcoin, you have the opportunity to avoid that problem because you can be your own merchant. You can, you know, run your own web store. You can run your own lightning, you know, tablet with lightning on it. And a BTC pay server, which is a new service that allows you to run it for yourself. But you know, coming back to fungibility, I think it's, you know, it would help Bitcoin to have stronger fungibility because it would prevent some of these problems. And to your point about like potential for fungibility breakdown, I mean, I think that could be that could potentially escalate to be a problem. You know, if if you go back to the you know, hundreds of years ago, the first uh, fungibility legal precedents, basically somebody. Uh, there, there's a Scottish one, right? So you know, he this merchant sent uh, some banknotes in the post. They didn't arrive. They turned up at the bank, and he tried to sue to get them back. That's and the court said, "Okay." So the court said, "We can't do that because it would damage the currency. It would impact uh, the ability to do business because everybody would be scared to accept money without rushing to the bank and checking if it's okay." So 
that could be a problem for Bitcoin, right? If, if people wouldn't accept your money unless it satisfied some service that says whether it's tainted or not, you could end up with several classes of coins which are trading at a discount or you can't spend or something like that. So I think fungibility is important for just functioning of uh, money. But also privacy is um, a pretty important thing for you know, lots of reasons. Companies want confidentiality, individuals want privacy for safety. And so he talks about confidential transactions which we implemented in the liquid sidechain. Um, but the same kind of technology m might one day work its, you know, find its way into Bitcoin. And that provides um, some kind of different trade-off. So it doesn't directly f improve fungibility, but it hides the values being transferred, which is good for security because it's, it's sort of like, you know, if, if you were paying for a taxi or something and you, and you open a wallet and there's $10,000 in there, okay, you don't want people to see that. So, you know, when you make a, a payment with a debit card, you don't advertise to the newspaper stand or what have you, your bank balance. And yet Bitcoin has this side effect unless you take uh, measures to avoid it, right? So confidential transactions uh, solves that particular problem. Do you see, just as, as a final question, do you see similarities in the privacy debate in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin today? And the privacy debates in the 90s with the clipper chip and all these attempts from the government to try to have a backdoor in cryptography, are there uh, similarities in this regard? I mean, I guess there is some analog to um, the interests of some parts of the establishment to want to have control or visibility. But I mean, in, in some ways, a bank account even is more private than Bitcoin today because other people can't look at your bank account. Now, you know, a court can maybe with an appropriate order, but you do have like a default privacy from the public, which with Bitcoin, sometimes you don't have if you're not careful, right? Um, I mean, of course, it's, um, it's somewhat private because there's no name associated with a, a coin or a set of public keys, but they do tend to get linked together because you will make a payment that uses multiple coins from the wallet and we can analyze it backwards and so on. So, I mean, actually confidential transactions can indirectly help because um, you can uh, more easily do coin join. So coin join is just the observation that uh, a transaction involves multiple coins being spent and multiple recipients with um, change and so on. And with confidential transactions, the amounts are encrypted. So it's ambiguous, fully ambiguous, which uh, is a payment, which is a change, or if the payers are you know, the same person or not is more ambiguous. And without confidential transactions, sometimes you would tend to, to it would be obvious because the amounts are incompatible. You know? So you could see that, well, one of the payments was $10 and this coin is $9, so it couldn't have been made by this coin. So you can sort of cross some things out and eliminate things. Very good. Thank you very much, Adam. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for talking with me.